Tonight, the media moguls and the downfall of Malcolm Turnbull. Kerry Stokes and Rupert Murdoch's role in the leadership coup exposed. More traffic and no time savings. The Commonwealth document casting more doubt over Sydney's light rail project. The fruit contamination crisis spreads. Police in Sydney are now investigating a needle found in an apple. And Sam Burgess breaks his silence. The South Star admits to the toll taken by the club's sexting scandal. Good evening, Juanita Phillips with ABC News. The ABC has uncovered the role played by Australia's two most powerful media barons in the lead-up to Malcolm Turnbull's removal as Prime Minister. It's emerged that Seven West media boss Kerry Stokes asked Rupert Murdoch why the latter's news corporation was running so hard against Mr Turnbull. Mr Murdoch reportedly told Mr Stokes that, quote, Malcolm has got to go. Political editor Andrew Proben has the story. Now, I suppose I should say something about the events of the, uh, of the last uh, week or so. It was with these words that a defeated Malcolm Turnbull alluded to another tussle. There was a determined uh, insurgency from a number of people, both in the party room uh, and, 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 and sort of backed by voices, powerful voices in the media. Uh, really to bring, if not bring down the government, certainly bring down my Prime Ministership. Some of those powerful voices hadn't hidden their disgust with the then Prime Minister. This is about our country. You've lost the battle, mate. We need to change the order. Other voices were also to be heard, but they didn't need a microphone. Rupert Murdoch was in Australia as the Liberal leadership melted. And he was swapping notes with fellow mogul Kerry Stokes of Seven West Media. The ABC's pieced together a story of how the Prime Ministership had become a tug of war between two powerful media moguls. In the weeks leading up to the crisis, Mr Turnbull confided in Kerry Stokes his belief that sections of the media, including News Corp, were out to get him. Mr Stokes took it upon himself to find out from Mr Murdoch himself. According to multiple retellings of what happened next, Mr Murdoch told Mr Stokes that Malcolm has got to go. The West Australians suggested that at risk a Labor government and a more militant industrial relations landscape. Rupert Murdoch's reply, three years of Labor, was a price he was willing to pay. This version of events has been relayed by Mr Turnbull to multiple people since he left for New York. He's also told people he called Mr Murdoch himself to ask whether he was using his media empire to campaign against his prime ministership. The 87-year-old denied he was doing so, but according to this account, said he was not responsible for what Boris might be doing, referring to the editor-in-chief of The Australian. Kerry Stokes is known to have urged senior figures inside the coalition, including Matthias Cormann, to stick with Mr Turnbull. This is my leader. But when his leadership was terminal, the media baron let it be known he didn't want the new PM to be Peter Dutton. His Perth newspaper, The West Australian, even editorialised in favour of Mr Turnbull stepping aside for Scott Morrison, although by the day of the second spill, his support had swung behind WA's own Julie Bishop. Malcolm Turnbull remains very bitter about the Prime Ministership that got away from him. He and his loyal supporters have reason to let it be known publicly that while ballots cast in the Liberal Party room are what brought him unstuck, the hands of media billionaires were never far from the action either. Andrew Probin, ABC News, Canberra. There's been fresh doubt cast on the benefits of Sydney's troubled CBD light rail by a leaked document obtained by the ABC. It shows that the federal government's key infrastructure funding body rejected a state government funding request for the light rail, saying it was unconvinced the project stacked up. The document warns the light rail would not save commuters any time and would make traffic congestion worse. Greg Miskelly has this exclusive report. It's the little letter that tipped a big bucket of cold water on the CBD light rail project. 
Written in 2013, the Infrastructure Australia Assessment, sent to Transport New South Wales, raised major problems with Sydney's light rail plan. It says, the light rail system does not generate time savings for commuters and it would be at capacity immediately and not be able to accommodate growth. The assessment obtained by the ABC and Fairfax Media also says the light rail could cause traffic snarls as congestion within Sydney's CBD could worsen with a light rail system by 12% and congestion would also be worse along Anzac Parade. The state government asked the federal experts for some money. They said, no money for you and don't build this. It'll wreck parts of Sydney. Gladys Berejiklian decided to push on anyway. The government says that its $2.1 billion spend on light rail is still the best solution for Sydney. It is an outstanding project. I can't wait for it to open so people can experience it for themselves. And uh, I'm looking forward to the project completing its milestones. The document also reveals that Infrastructure Australia criticised the state government for not including the substantial costs of disruption and delays in its light rail plan. Those extra costs are now the subject of a major compensation claim for $1.1 billion lodged by key contractor Axiona in the Supreme Court. Leading engineer John Carson recently gave evidence about crippling utility problems on a light rail project in Edinburgh. He says Sydney is facing the same pitfalls. You're going through old streets um, with totally uncharted services. Um, and uh, regardless how many you think there, there are, there will always be three or four times more. He says the government should quickly renegotiate its contract with the builders instead of wasting time in court. You've got to sit around the table, deal with them, and uh, at some time or other somebody's got to put their hands in their pocket. I think New South Wales have, have, uh, have got, got to pay for it. The government argues its money pit will become a money spinner. We've had a number of modifications and claims made against the project, uh, but the reality is uh, that this is going to be a phenomenal project, transformative. An investment unlikely to pay dividends until well after next year's election. Greg Miss Kelly, ABC News. The fruit contamination scare is spreading. Police in New South Wales are now investigating reports of sharp metal objects being found in bananas and apples as well as strawberries. The impact of the crisis is being felt across the country, with some farms now being forced to dump their produce. The grim reality of the needle contamination scandal in Queensland. Sunshine Coast business Donnybrook forced to destroy its produce amid the ongoing saga. On social media, the owner's daughter posted, this is no doubt the worst thing to ever happen to my family. Cases of needles in strawberries continue to be reported across the nation. In New South Wales, more than 20 incidents are being investigated, including cases involving other fruit. It's not just strawberries that now we are um, receiving reports for. We've also had some isolated reports of contamination of uh, banana and apple in uh, the Sydney area. The copycat cases do seem to be a, a troll-like activity. Um, it's certainly attention-seeking. West Australia is now dealing with five cases after a student bit into a strawberry today and found a needle. In most Australian states, food tampering carries a maximum jail term of 10 years. I think a 10-year punishment's a fair, you know, that's a fair sentence and I think that should be a deterrent for anyone. Um, however, the motive behind those things is unclear. Food tampering is one of those things where it's the epitome of free will. What we're seeing here is somebody who wanted to inflict harm and wanted to instill fear. In Adelaide, the produce markets are taking their own precautions with plans to introduce a metal detector to scan fruit. It's a $50 million industry and that's what's at risk here in South Australia and we want to ensure that uh, we can continue selling um, fresh produce to our, to our consumers. The Queensland Premier now offering help to struggling producers, announcing a $1 million fund to boost the local industry. This is an attack on all of us. I call on anyone with any information on the culprits to come forward. The Queensland strawberry industry is calling for calm and common sense as the scandal continues and farmers have a simple message for those who want to show their support. Buy local strawberries, buy local produce. A $100,000 reward remains in place for any information that leads to an arrest. Ashley Stevenson, ABC News. The Liberal Party's so-called women problem is escalating, with a key crossbencher now reviewing the conditions of her support for the government. 
It follows claims by backbencher Anne Sudmalis that she was bullied by a fellow Liberal and will not contest the next election. Prime Minister Scott Morrison is trying to restore order amid growing unrest and departures over the party's gender imbalance. We don't want you coming back dirty. Oh, thank you. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> Hands are always hard to keep clean when leading a party dishing dirt by the barrel load. Bullying, betrayal and backstabbing have been the hallmarks of one of my state Liberal colleagues, Gareth Ward, over the past six and a half years. Anne Sidmalis is the latest female Liberal to quit, but the first to name names. This was all about Gareth's narcissistic revenge planned and plotted. Obviously I disagree with those allegations. The claims have been backed up by others on the Labor side too. It was very, very vindictive and, um, you know, tried on, on several occasions to intimidate me. But the state MP accused denies it. I absolutely abhor bullying in all its forms and uh, would never bully. The Prime Minister's promised a rigorous process to deal with his colleagues' complaints and reminded them why they're there. To serve the Australian people, not to carry on with stupid games. But this latest episode has prompted another furious debate about the culture in politics and women. Why would women bother to enter this arena, this bear pit in here, if this is the way they're going to be treated? I don't believe that the Liberal Party has uh, a problem with women. The numbers would suggest otherwise. Women make up just 24% of Liberals in federal parliament. In most states, it's even worse, falling as low as 15%. Bucking the trend is Tasmania, which has a different voting system, and the two territories. The Liberal Party... Uh, absolutely needs to address this. A Liberal insider turned crossbencher has upped the ante, threatening to withdraw her support for the coalition in the lower house if it doesn't get its own house in order. I will give uh, the government time until uh, the by-election in Wentworth. On current trends, the number of Liberal women will fall even further after the next election. Party insiders know there's a problem and they know it's costing them votes, but so far, no one has come up with a solution. Liberals insist quotas are out of the question and far from shifting the culture, some believe women simply need to toughen up. As uh, Harry S. Truman once said, if you can't take the heat, get out of the kitchen. A reference from another generation as Scott Morrison tries to usher in a new one. Jane Norman, ABC News, Canberra. Well, not so long ago, Judge Brett Kavanaugh appeared a certainty to fill the vacancy on the US Supreme Court. But the nomination of Donald Trump's favourite is now in jeopardy over sexual assault claims. The judge says he wasn't even at the party where the assault allegedly took place three decades ago. Both he and his accuser will be called to testify in the Senate next week. Chief Foreign Correspondent Philip Williams reports from Washington. <laughs> Judge Brett Kavanaugh's nomination was already controversial. He was seen as far too conservative for the Democrats. Now he's facing an accusation of sexual assault. University professor Christine Blassie Ford said the judge attacked her at a party back in the early 1980s. Dr uh, Blasey believes that he attempted to rape her when she was in high school and that bears on his fitness and character. Despite the allegations, Donald Trump remains confident his pick will get through confirmation. Judge Kavanaugh is one of the finest people that I've ever known. Uh, he's an outstanding intellect, an outstanding judge, respected by everybody. Never had even a little blemish on his record. And the president went on the attack, accusing the Democrats of a last-minute ambush. And they shouldn't have waited till literally the last days. They should have done it a lot sooner. Both Judge Kavanaugh and his accuser are expected to testify at a hearing next Monday. That will delay any confirmation vote. She should not be insulted. She should not be ignored. She should testify under oath. Before the allegations surfaced, Judge Kavanaugh looked a certainty for the Supreme Court thanks to Republican numbers in the Senate. Now some are reserving judgment. If Judge Kavanaugh has lied about what happened, that would be disqualified. Judge Kavanaugh has strongly denied all the allegations and says he's looking forward to clearing his name. It's unclear where this will go next, but with the midterm elections due in November, a delayed confirmation process could further damage the president's choice for the Supreme Court. That would be a bitter blow for an already embattled Donald Trump. Philip Williams, ABC News, Washington. 
Still to come this hour, an exclusive interview with Catherine Marriott. The WA businesswoman speaks out on the sexual harassment allegations made against Barnaby Joyce. So you said there were a few things that happened that changed your thinking about whether you're going to report it or not. What were those things? A friend of mine who knows me really well knows about the incident and she said to me, Maz, you've spent your whole entire career building capacity in young people particularly. If you choose to say nothing now and five years from now this behaviour is still going on, will you sleep at night? And the answer to that was unequivocally no. They're the numbers that universities didn't want you to see. A confidential report obtained by the ABC shows some Year 12 students offered places in teaching degrees received eight-hour schools of between 0 and 19. That has sparked renewed calls from the federal opposition for much higher entry standards. National education reporter Natasha Robertson has the story. Hi. Hannah Matthews is living her dream, studying primary school teaching at university, but she can't wait to be in a classroom with kids. You're able to watch them grow, you're able to be with them when they achieve, help them when they don't, be there for all the small moments. So this looks really good. Hannah scored top marks at high school, but among aspiring teachers, she's the exception, not the rule. That's according to a secret report that's revealed the ATAR scores of teaching candidates, well below national data tabled in Parliament recently. Very unsatisfactory. Retired Professor John Mack examined the scores of all school leavers offered 2015 teaching course places in New South Wales and the ACT. The data showed some prospective teachers had scored as low as 0 to 19 in Year 12. 40% of offers went to those scoring between 50 and 69. And only 7% of offers went to students with an ATAR of 90 or above. When Professor Mack tried to publish the report, his then employer, the University of Sydney, demanded it be destroyed. I think it's hard to regard that as anything other than a suppression order. The University of Sydney says publication of the report would breach its protocols. I think there are significant questions that the universities need to answer. Why do they want this data hidden? Some universities say high marks are not the only consideration. In the profession of teaching, we want to look at other attributes. We want to look at character, morals, dispositions, values, attitudes. But the low figures have sparked fresh calls for a minimum entry score for teaching. We believe that universities should be targeting the top 30% of graduates. I do think it is important that teachers are held to a high standard of literacy and numeracy because no one wants their child being taught by someone who doesn't know what they're teaching. Natasha Robinson, ABC News. All sides of politics have expressed concern at the state of aged care after Four Corners last night exposed stories of abuse and neglect. The government says its royal commission into the sector will be thorough, but many in the industry say stronger oversight and more transparency are needed right now. James Oten reports. David Barton is still looking for answers, three years after his mother died. It just seems to me utterly bizarre that how mum can go into a, uh, a nursing home being quite reasonably healthy but suffering from dementia and yet to find that uh, in, in eight weeks' time she's dead. David Barton's mother, Margaret Barton, was given excessive sedatives at two Mornington aged care centres, leading to multiple falls and bone fractures. A coroner later found this overdosing contributed to her death. I remember at one point going back home to Dad and, and walking in the house and bursting into tears and saying, they're killing my mother, they're killing my mother. It's stories like these that the government is expecting its Royal Commission into Aged Care to uncover. We can focus on the facts, uh, that we can confront those facts. I'm not afraid of the facts, I'm not afraid of the truth. But in a time-sensitive industry, many can't afford to wait. The government's touted an Integrity and Complaints Commission, a one-stop shop to police the industry. It has bipartisan support, but a bill has only just been introduced to Parliament. The Aged Care Quality and Safety Bill needs to go through quickly and the Commission start on the 1st of January. But both sides of politics are more hesitant to agree on minimum staff ratios more than um, happy to sit down with the government uh, and to have this sort of discussion if they want to implement uh, ratios now. 
One study says aged care residents should be given 4.3 hours of personal care every day. But research funded by the Australian Nursing Federation found that on average, residents are given little more than 2.8 hours a day. The Federation says this data should be used as a starting point to work out appropriate staff ratios and that such ratios should be made publicly available for every nursing home in the country. I think one of the first things we could start doing is make the sector much more transparent and much more accountable. My comment very simply is I don't want ratios of poor staff. There's a profit motive there rather than a care motive. A loud call for quality care. James Oaten, ABC News, Melbourne. At least 40 bodies have been pulled from the rubble of a large, large landslide in the Philippines and dozens of people are still missing. They were buried when a, a slope gave way during Typhoon Mangkut, which ripped across the region at the weekend. ABC correspondent Bill Bertels reports from the town of Itogan. The landslide that scarred this remote mountainside buried families in its wake. Rescuers have been digging in the mud with shovels and their bare hands. The slope is too steep to move in heavy excavation equipment and damaged roads forced rescuers to reach the treacherous terrain on foot. At first they thought they might find survivors, but all hope is now fading. One by one they've brought out the bodies, miners, their wives and children who had been living near the open pit of an illegal gold mine. They came here so they could find a livelihood. Then this happened. What we want now is just to find his body so we can bring him back home. In this poverty-stricken region where jobs are scarce, panning for gold is the only way to earn a living. The government has tried to ban small-scale mining because of previous landslides. The president says they've caused too much heartache. If I were to try to do my thing, I will close all mining in the Philippines. Some miners had taken refuge in an abandoned bunkhouse and a chapel, but the buildings were crushed by rocks. 150,000 people made it to evacuation centres before the storm hit. For three days now, hundreds of exhausted workers have been coming and going from this site. Some told us this afternoon they'd pulled another six bodies from the mud. As the search enters another night, there's not a lot of optimism of finding people alive. So, up above the site, relatives line up to see if their loved ones are among the new bodies recovered. For those anxiously waiting, there's still a glimmer of hope. Bill Bertels, ABC News, Itogon, on the island of Luzon. To finance now, and the local share market fell back today after US President Donald Trump ratcheted up his trade war with China. He's announced new tariffs on another $200 billion of Chinese imports. But as Alan Kohler reports, the Australian dollar has gone back above 72 US cents. The tariff on the latest $200 billion worth of imports from China to the US is 10%. And President Trump has said it will go to 25% next year if China doesn't end what he calls its unfair trade practices. Now, there are 5,745 items on the new list, down from 6,031 announced on June the 10th, with things like smartwatches, bicycle helmets and child car seats removed from it. But left on the list are nine pages of species of fish, cotton thread and frog's legs, fresh chilled or frozen, among thousands of other things. Now, Trump's trade war already seems to have had a chilling effect on world trade, with the growth rate in the volume of global trade falling from 5 to 3 per cent this year from those very high levels of last year. The Trump administration has now put tariffs on about half of all Chinese imports. So quite a big deal for China, but America imports about $3 trillion worth of stuff per year. So Trump's action so far will only be a blip on this chart of the average American tariff rate, which is about 2%, and won't be anything like the Smoot-Hawley tariff of 1930, which contributed to the Great Depression. Not yet, anyway. Market reaction to the new tariffs was fairly muted overall, although the US share market did fall last night, with the Nasdaq dropping almost 1.5%. And Japan and Chinese share markets went up quite a lot today. The local market followed suit. 
dropped with the US down four tenths of one percent, although the three listed aged care operators managed to claw back some of yesterday's big losses that followed the announcement of a royal commission into their industry. More falls by base metals and oil last night, but gold and oil, iron ore went up slightly, and the Australian dollar is just above 72 US cents tonight. And that's finance. NRL star Sam Burgess has finally addressed the media on the Rabbitoh sexting scandal, but he's given very little away. The South Sydney forward has been under heavy scrutiny after a newspaper published naked images of players allegedly linked to his social media account. Burgess did concede the saga has taken a heavy personal toll. On the training track, Sam Burgess did the hard yards. Before the cameras, he barely gave an inch. I'm not getting into detail of anything. Um, you know, there's an NRL investigation going on at the moment. Um, you know, and I'm happy for them to get to the truth. I really am. It's four days since the sexting claims were published. Burgess expects the NRL's investigation to wrap up by Thursday. I just want to protect my, my family in this whole thing. I've got a wife, I've got a daughter, and my wife's heavily pregnant. So I just want them to be safe and happy. And in my current situation at home, there's just no chance of that. It's an unwanted diversion for the Rabbitohs, who are preparing to take on the minor premiers. I just want to get the, all the troops together and, uh, and you know, hopefully we can all move as one on the same page. So, look, it's just um, we, we group we're refocusing on you know, what, what's at hand on Saturday night. They're, they're going to be really hungry, obviously, to come out and play well. And uh, being in teams before where you've had some controversy, it, it really binds you together. So we're, we're expecting a really tough, hard, physical side. The Roosters side will be without its star fullback Latrell Mitchell on Saturday night. His suspension leaves big shoes to fill. Those guys practice, you know, all all year whether they're they're the first choice or not, and um, you know they're they're going to have to step up this week and, and and fill the role. The two oldest clubs in the league squared off twice this year with one win apiece. Chloe Hart, ABC News, Sydney. Time for the weather now, and even though we're hearing about some showers coming, we shouldn't get too excited, Graham. No, it's not looking that promising, Juanita. Unfortunately, over New South Wales, we've pretty much got a dry air mass over the state. And even though we've got a couple of onshore wind flows set to develop behind a couple of cool changes, it's only going to be shallow moisture, so it's just not going to feed anything in the way of worthwhile falls. Now, in Sydney, the northeast sea breeze helped cap our temperatures this afternoon, particularly closer to the coast. We recorded 21.7 in the city. That sea breeze failed to reach into the far west, though, so uh, Richmond recorded 28.6 this afternoon. Now, overnight minimums were generally cooler than average across the state, with the southern slopes and the tablelands recording the coldest of the temperatures. It actually dropped to minus 3.7 at Cootamunda Airport this morning. Now, the day's been sunny, apart from the south, where cloud increased. This is ahead of a front and trough. That's recently entered the far south of the state, and apart from the northeast, maximums were generally above the average through New South Wales. Now, that cloud that's moving towards the state is associated with a weakening front and also a trough. Now, that's going to produce very little rainfall, but behind the change, we will see another pool of very cold and dry air sweep through the state. We've got very warm temperatures and increasing fire dangers developing ahead of that change though. Unfortunately, we're not looking at much in the way of rainfall. Now, snow is actually set to fall to 800 metres in Victoria, 600 metres in Tasmania, possible hail in both those states as well as South Australia, but rainfall totals in all three cities like New South Wales is going to be very patchy and very light. So any rainfall behind that change will almost be non-existent in New South Wales. There's just a low chance of thunderstorms about the northern ranges. They'll bring better potential of damaging winds rather than worthwhile rainfall. Any other showers are more likely about the far southern border parts. So it'll be a sunny day or at least a sunny start to the day ahead of some afternoon cloud and those isolated thundery showers threatening northwesterly winds ahead of the afternoon change in the west and south and also the far north overnight. Now, strong winds on the waters ahead of and behind that change. Mostly sunny and dry, apart from some areas of clouds and very isolated light showers in the far south, freshening northwest winds ahead of that morning and early afternoon cooler change. Strong winds in the south, but more likely offshore on the Illawarra. Partly cloudy, but mostly dry inland. That southwesterly wind change spreading throughout in the afternoon. Just some isolated thunderstorms about the northern slopes. So strong winds should remain on the offshore waters. We've got lows of 8 to 15. Our tops have reached about 27 to 28 degrees. 
It's going to be a mostly sunny day, apart from some late cloud, a possible isolated coastal shower in the evening. That wind change is actually due into Sydney around 2 p.m. So very little with those showers Thursday morning. A little bit more likely as we head into the end of the weekend, Monita, but falls will still be light. Thanks, Graham. Lee Sales is here now with 7.30.